Petty Officer Xander Gamble and I'm currently in a replica aircraft carrier ready room. Here we have technology that the early naval aviators of 1911 could only dream of. Throughout this show you will hear the stories of five naval astronauts. But where did naval aviation come from? What are its roots? December 1903 will always be a historical landmark for aviation with the first powered flight by the Wright brothers. The Navy was called into action in order for Glenn H. Curtis and Eugene Ely to try the first carrier takeoff in 1910. Although the attempt failed, it opened the partnership the Navy would have with aviation. On January 26, 1911, Curtis made the first hydroplane flight in the United States. During World War I, the first catapult launch was conducted launching a whole new era of aviation. From this point on, aircraft would begin their huge strides in foil design, engine dynamics, and overall capabilities in order to extend the aircraft's mission. By World War II, the Navy was using airplanes for fighting, recon, and even bombing. World War II also saw landmarks in naval aviation. December 7, 1941 was one of the largest airstrikes ever seen at the time. Seaborne aircraft were used in all sorts of fleet action, as seen in the battles of Midway and Bismarck. They were used for preemptive strikes in the Battle of Taranto, as support for ground forces in the Battle of Okinawa and the invasion on Italy, and anti-submarine warfare throughout the Atlantic and Pacific. Since World War II, naval aviation has made history on land, at sea, and even in space. Because of the training naval pilots receive, these aviators have been on the cusp of history. Whether it's first flight, the first into battle, or the first into space, naval aviators have been there. What is it that has brought these pilots to the top? What made them decide to fly in the first place? Sit back as Major General Charles Bolden, the head of NASA, and Captain Eugene Cernan, Gemini and Apollo veteran, look in depth at the training and the ability of the naval aviator. Flying to me, uh, I guess, uh, from my early days in life, uh, has been a passion. Um, soon as the wheels lifted off, I mean, it was incredible. The, the feeling of exhilaration and everything, and I fell in love with it. Every day, flying teaches me something new about flying, and about myself. The change from the Wright brothers uh, to an F-18 or an F-35 or an F-22 in the Air Force today is incredible. Uh, whether you're talking about speed, altitude, ability to, to deliver weapons precisely, it's those types of developments in aviation that have enabled us to bring about a space shuttle, for example. Houston now controlling the flight of Atlantis. Not that naval aviators are any better than anybody else. It's just I think our training and our attitude and our passion in, in, in how we're trained uh, does have a significance because, you know, the first American in space was a naval aviator. The first American to orbit the Earth wore navy wings of gold. The first man and the last man to step foot on the surface of the moon were naval aviators. Five out of six lunar landings were commanded by naval aviators, aviators, as well as Apollo 13 that didn't have the opportunity to land. And I think, I think the reason for that goes back to those early days where we did prepare to land aboard an aircraft carrier, where you didn't take anything for granted. Um, people sometimes forget that things like the space shuttle or even a capsule uh, at some point in their life, going into space and coming back, they turn into aerodynamic vehicles. And even if it's a cone, it's got to be able to glide through the atmosphere and make a landing somewhere in the ballpark for where we want it. That's what naval aviation teaches, precise landings. When you're coming back aboard a carrier, I mean, you've got to be very precise. Uh, you, can make, you can trap on one of four wires. If you miss them, then you're toast. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's just a, a level of precision uh, that is unprecedented. We do the same thing in the space program. In carrier aviation, if you don't plan on being the best, then you're in the wrong job because anything less than the best 
is not going to is not good enough. And if you are not in control of your destiny, if you don't make it happen, it ain't going to happen. And and I think that carries over to the challenges that we had, that training, that background as naval aviators, to the challenges that we had and the commitment we made to be the best. When we put somebody on another planet, as we are going to do when we go to Mars, we've got to be able to make a carrier engine. We've got to be able to, to send them to a very precise spot on the Martian surface that we know it's going to be safe and level and everything else. When we sent Neil Armstrong to the surface of the moon, what was most incredible about that was it was a, it was a precise carrier landing. We knew where we wanted them to be. Uh, Neil was able to take over manually because he found that where he was going to land, that precise spot, was a little bit rougher than we had thought. And so he moved just a little bit to one side and landed safely. And that's, that's the kind of precision that's required when you're going to another planet. There it is, proceeded. And there it is. Here's Coming down on the descent itself to the surface of the moon. Very dynamic, noisy, people are talking to you. Although things are happening fast during a landing on the moon, I'm, I'm going to make it happen. There was no question in my mind. And if a problem occurred and I had to board, I was prepared to do that. Just like you're prepared to take it around aboard a carrier at night if it isn't a perfect landing. But this time we didn't have a chance to come around again. So the determination and the commitment that you had was to do it right the first time because you're not going to get the second chance. And, 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 and that relates very closely to the attitude you had to have and the training you had as a naval aviator. Is that what makes a difference? Uh, is, is that, we didn't have a 12,000 feet of concrete to land on, on the moon, but you don't abort at aboard ship either. On May 25th, 1961, President John F. Kennedy made the bold move of committing the nation to putting a man on the moon before the end of the decade. And it was former naval aviator Neil Armstrong who made that first step. In fact, 15 of the first 29 astronauts selected by NASA wore Navy wings of gold. Now, we'll hear about the lives of three of these Navy astronauts. First of all, I uh, picked the Navy because uh, I had some uh, uh, previous exposure to the Navy. My uncle graduated from the Naval Academy in 1913. My dream was someday to fly. You know, you go to the movies once a week, uh, see the newsreels of what was happening during the war, particularly in the Pacific, and anonymous heroes in my life are the ones that inspired me to, to dream. Dream about flying, dream about flying particularly off of aircraft carriers. I uh, uh, have wanted to be a pilot since I was a small boy, 10 or so. I grew up in World War II, so I saw them in the movies and I wanted to be a pilot. Made two cruises in the little old, old Skyhawk A4 on the old small 27 Charlie carriers. I made a cruise on a Shangri-La and a Hancock. They assigned me to a jet attack squadron flying F-9, F-8s, Cougars. And I can remember uh, one time, we were down at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, doing loft bombing. And I don't know why, but I just pulled too tight. I don't, real tight. And I stalled the airplane, and it flipped on me. It went out of control, and I really didn't know exactly what to do. And that airplane came out of it on its own because that airplane would do that. Well, I think the military service is an excellent career for anybody to be in. I, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I look back on my, my Navy career, what I've done, what I've learned, what I saw. It taught me how important teamwork is, uh, working together, whether on board ship or in a squadron that I was in, uh, or even with my kids at home, good leadership. But teamwork is very, very important. Oh, I think, I, think, I think my military training, uh, along with my education, uh, 
contributed significantly to whatever I was able to accomplish. Uh, Gemini 9, when I had all kinds of trouble on that spacewalk because we didn't anticipate, uh, oddly enough, the laws of, of Newton and zero gravity got me in a great deal of trouble. I've called that, that, that two and a half hours in space outside the spacecraft, uh, <clears throat> spacewalk from hell, and it was. But the determination to not give up, the determination to not give in to the environment that I was confronted with during that walk, it probably would save my life. I was, you know, I, I was not gonna let this get to me. You know, a lot of problems happened. My visor got all fogged up. I ripped my suit on the inside and back. Uh, we knew getting back in the spacecraft, I've always you know, I, I compared it to trying to put a champagne cork back into a champagne bottle. I was cork and the spacecraft was a bottle. We knew it was going to be difficult. We practiced it a lot, but we never had an opportunity to really, really practice it in, a, in an extended period of time in zero gravity because you can't reproduce it on Earth. I was in a survival mode and I was not going to give in to the enemy. And the enemy at that point in time was my environment. My spacesuit was like plaster of Paris. It was hard to bend. And time, time was the enemy. Daylight, darkness. I had to confront all those things and I, I was not gonna give in. I've had a experience that's been given to me by this country that not very many people have had, 11 others besides me, Maybe I need to somehow find a way with my art to celebrate and document this great adventure. Uh, it's my duty to do that sort of. I've been given this gift. What should I do with it? I need to do this other thing because no one of the 12 of us is interested in art except me. And if I could learn to do it well enough, then I could leave a legacy for future generations of stories. Okay, yeah, we've had a problem here. This is Houston, say again, please. Oh, Houston, we've had a problem. We've had a main B bus wonderful. Roger, main B undervolt. Okay, stand by, 13, we're looking at it. And we had a pretty large bang associated with the uh, caution and warning there. Well, on 13, uh, the, uh, the explosion, of course, caused a lot of consternation, and, and, but the crew, all military trained initially, uh, all didn't panic. Uh, the three of us had to figure out what went wrong, or more, what, how do we get home? How do we work? And then here's a, a good example of good leadership because we had communication with Mission Control. And these were people that knew about uh, crisis management uh, because 13 was really a classic case of crisis management and how to work the, the problems out one by one to get us back home again. I turned on an opportunity to walk on the moon on Apollo 16, would have been Apollo 16, to take my chance on getting my command. I didn't want to get a command to give orders. I wanted the responsibility. I wanted to have the opportunity to prove that I was good enough to command a squadron. I've always said, I didn't go to the moon not to come home. You gotta come down fast enough so you don't run out of fuel. But you gotta come down slow enough so you can stop your rate of descent. About 80 feet you run into dust. You go IFR, you can't really see much of anything. And at that point in time, I, you know, the ground can't tell you anything. I, I, told, I told my partner, Jack Schmidt, the right seat, I said, I don't wanna hear anymore. Yeah, yeah, you, you're, you're eyeballing, you're, you've made a determination where you're gonna land and you know how much fuel you got. And when you touch down, you shut the engine down and plunk, the dust is gone. The vibration is gone. 
the, the noise is gone. Nobody's talking. And all of a sudden you realize for what could have been 10 seconds or 10 minutes, I don't know, that you are now seeing what has never been seen with human eyes before. You are now where no human beings have ever been in the history of mankind, ever, before. Uh, you tell, tell the ground. The Challenger has landed. Roger Challenger, that's super. Okay, boy, you bet it is, Gordo. But you said shut down, I shut down, and we dropped, didn't we? Yes, sir. But we is here. Man, is we here. How's that look? That Pressure. looks good. Pressures look great. Okay, that side's complete. Houston, you can tell America that Challenger is a source literal. I was strolling on the moon one day. In, in a merry, merry month of December. Now, May. May. May the month. As Vietnam, and then later the Cold War, drew to a close, naval aviators continued to be on the forefront for technology advancements, ranging from flight instruments to aircraft design. They'd also be called upon in the use of the space shuttle, as more scientific experiments were to be conducted in space. And ever since I was 10 years old, uh, sitting in front of a black and white television growing up in Southern California, uh, when I watched Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin bounce them on that lunar sur surface. And that was it. So yeah, ever since I was 10, that was my dream. All right, I don't mind a bit. They've got the flag up now. I never dreamed of flying before I came to the Naval Academy and then decided I was going into marine aviation. Uh, really never dreamed of being an astronaut. My mother's father went to the Naval Academy, graduated in 1930, uh, became a naval aviator at the, and uh, flew during World War II. My father also went to the Naval Academy. Uh, graduated in 1951, became a naval aviator, flew during Vietnam, and so when I thought about the path I needed to take to become an astronaut, it was pretty easy just to go with family tradition and follow in their footsteps and uh, come here to the Naval Academy and go into naval aviation as well. Uh, every midshipman belongs to a company, and uh, my company officer my first year was a Marine, a major by the name of Major John Riley Love, who was uh, incredibly uh, strict, uh, but unbelievably fair. And he reminded me a lot of my dad. And uh, he became a role model and a mentor to me my first year. And when it was time to decide what I wanted to do, uh, in spite of what I had said, I said, I want to be like him. So I decided I was coming into the Marine Corps. I owe a lot to the Naval Academy, I owe a lot to the Navy for giving me, a, one, a great academic background, uh, to uh, a lot of operational experiences. I think that prepared me well to be selected as an astronaut and to then go on and fly four shuttle missions. My time in Vietnam was incredible. I, I actually was in a squadron that was stationed in a place called Nam Pong, Thailand, uh, in the middle of the Thai jungle. And we were there toward the end of the, the actual conflict in Vietnam. And, and most of what we did was night all-weather interdiction. I must say that to this day, I don't think I ever flew an airplane with more capability than the A6. It was, uh, uh, it was built to be an all-weather attack aircraft. It had a single mission, uh, which it did incredibly well. Everything that you'd learn um, during your NATOP checks, flying around as a young aviator, practicing your emergency procedures, you know, you um, brought those same skills to the simulator, which more than anything was situational awareness. Developing that sense of being aware of what's going on around you was really critical to doing well as an astronaut given the pace of things that can happen on board. And we have rookie Wendy Lawrence, also the flight engineer. Uh, first time I got to look out the window and look back at the planet, obviously a very emotional event for me. At that point I realized that all that 25 years of hard work and lots of up and down and blood, sweat and tears so to speak had finally paid off and I was living my dream. Two, one, we have booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour on a voyage to view the universe. 
I was commissioned in flight school when we walked on the moon. Uh, and although I was awestruck, it just never occurred to me that I could be an astronaut. But I did want to be a test pilot. And, uh, and while I was a test pilot, uh, a group of the first group of shuttle astronauts selected by NASA, the group that was selected in 1978, came back to Patuxent River, Maryland, where I was serving as a test pilot. And I met a lot of them. One of them was Dr. Ron McNair, who was killed on the Challenger crew. Ron had always dreamed of being an astronaut. And before he left, he asked me if I was going to apply for the program. I told him, not on your life. And he said, why not? I said, because they'll never pick me. And, and he looked at me and he said, you know, that's the dumbest thing I ever heard. Uh, here you are, you're a test pilot. How do you know if you don't ask? to the Navy. I would have not had my childhood dream fulfilled. I would not have ended up as an astronaut without the incredible experiences that the Navy gave to me and opportunities as well. The drag chute has been deployed. Now that this centennial year is drawing to a close, it is time to look ahead and see what the future holds for naval aviation, both in manned and unmanned flight. I, like everybody else, can see the handwriting on the wall because it's, uh, people feel that it's safer for crew members to be able to hand off uh, some of the more risky missions to an, a robotic vehicle. We're doing the same thing in the space program. When I, when I send humans to Mars, uh, in your lifetime, by the way, um, they will be arriving at a base camp that a robot has set up. Hopefully, we will continue to see humans involved in aircraft, in operating them, in making decisions about how to carry out the mission, because that's a skill that I think we still excel at. We're really good at problem solving. We're good at being creative when we're faced with a situation that we might not have uh, anticipated. I, I see it just evolving to being uh, more complex. People will have to be smarter to do it. The Navy will train them to be smarter to do it. They can't build things that humans can't do. We haven't yet developed a computer that has the uh, uh, quick decision capability as the, uh, as the brain. And so I think men will always have a position in naval aviation. Uh, but how we, how we operate right now uh, is going to be kind of interesting. And here we are in the centennial year, 100 years of, of naval aviation. And who knows what the next hundred years will bring. We hope you've enjoyed hearing about the naval careers of some of the pioneers of space. We close with some of their personal messages to you. The Navy is, a, is an excellent, uh, uh, not only an excellent career, it's an excellent education for people uh, who, when they retire, they, uh, they, they're so much more adult and an asset to the country. Make sure that you are in a position to t take advantage of those opportunities when they are presented to you. You want to use your life in a way that's worthy because you only got one and it's going to go away eventually. And you want to feel like, well, I did the best with that one life as I could do. We have a set of principles that are unlike most others and, and those are our core values, honor, courage and commitment. And I would say, you know, make them mean more than just words to you. Just make them understand that they are principles by which we live. Always shoot for the moon. Maybe not literally, but figuratively. Always shoot for the moon because even if you miss, you're going to land somewhere among the stars. Don't wait for someone else to do it for you. Go out and make it happen yourself. Be in control of your own destiny and have faith in a lot of people who are helping you to accomplish your dreams. The dreamers of today, dream, dream, dream. The dream I dreamed as a, as a 10 year old. The dreamers of today are the doers of tomorrow. So be a dreamer.